algún este alguna conexión que esté ajena a la sala, este no duden en comentarnos o en su caso ignorarlo y luego luego nosotros estamos este, reaccionando para ponerlo en sala de espera. Gracias. gracias. Muchas gracias. En ese momento voy a dar eh, transmisión y este ya toda la comunicación la hacemos vía WhatsApp, ¿les parece? Sí, por favor, muchas gracias. Okay. Well. The Instituto Politécnico Nacional welcomes you to the second session of the talks entitled High Frequency and Terahertz Devices and Circuits Perspectives of Emerging and Advanced Technologies, Part Two. Today, We begin at nine o'clock and before um, starting, I will uh, translate the message. El Instituto Politécnico Nacional les da la más cordial bienvenida a la segunda sesión de pláticas tituladas eh, Dispositivos y Circuitos de Alta Frecuencia y Terahertz perspectivas para tecnologías emergentes y avanzadas. Debido a la naturaleza internacional de estas pláticas, estas serán en inglés. Now, Dr. Fontes, please introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Hi, hello. Good morning, everybody. Our first speaker will be the Dr. Gader Bandi. Gader Darbandi is a research associate in the Nano Electronic Device Modeling Research Groups, Competence Center for Nanotechnology and Photonics of THM University of Applied Science, Mittelhensen in Given, Germany, since March 2018. From March 2013 to March 2018, he was a postdoctoral research in the chair for electron device and integrate circuits in the Institute of Electrical Engineering and Electronics, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Technical University Dresden in Dresden, Germany. He was responsible and working for silicon nanowire and organic polymeric project within the Center for Advanced Electronics Dresden cluster for excellence. He received the master and PhD degree in electrical engineering from the University of Rovira y Virgili Tarraganova, Spain in 2009 and 2012, respectively. Now, will the Dr. Gader Darbani can start, please? You have the mic with you. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction and the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. And I just like to know, now you see my slides, right? Yes, we can see it. And okay, then you can hear properly, then I can slide, start my presentation. Yeah. As you mentioned, my name is Gader Darbandi, and I am going to talk about single gate, double gate, and gate around transistor, considering nanowires and nano sheet, and showing RF performance. I will also show the DC performance of such a devices. Actually, our group, NanoP, it is located in Germany, Gießen at University of Applied Science, Mittelhessen. And as you can see, the Gießen is actually 70 kilometers. North Frankfurt, 
And this is our campus and our office. And right now I am in my office giving this presentation from our office. And there is around 18,000 students in our university. And our group is mainly developing compact models, which it is input can go to the circuit designers in very low vehicle. And we also design optimize structures, which this is supposed to be input or feedback, which we give to the technology people. And if someone is interested to check the work we are doing within the guru, the link is given here. With this introduction, I would like to show the silicon nanowire array. This is actually the devices fabricated at Nanda TU Dresden. This is the, my previous university. And as you can see, this is a source tray. And we can see parallel array of nanowires. They are putting next to each other. And the reason for putting this nanowires, like bunch of nanowires to each other, the idea is to increase the performance of device per gate bit. But the question was regarding this distance between the nanowires. What is the optimum distance, whether it should be zero or 100 nanometers, for example, and why? So this is the question we are going to answer within this presentation, and again, this, the idea is to increase the num nanowire density, and the reason they are using this nanowire, maybe if we consider this structure, this is silicon nanowire, oxide, and this is like gate all around the structure. This kind of device is supposed to be, or considered to be like ideal device because of very good channel control, but the problem of such a device is in one single nanowire. The device width is very small, so the drive current is not enough for most of the applications. That is the reason they are putting them in parallel. But again, the question is this one, what is the optimum distance between the nanowires? Because if we consider two nanowires, if they are close to each other, this electrostatics, they see each other and this electrostatic interaction, which we call it screening effect. We are going to analyze it and show in the optimum distance for RF and even for DC performance. With this introduction, I will just show what is the outline of my talk. As I mentioned, I am going to discuss 3D frame, gate architecture or silicon nanowire effect. We calibrate our simulation to the measurement, DC and AC characteristics. With this kind of simulations, we are showing, I am going to show details about DC and AC performance of one single nanowire and the performance per gate width. And finally, I will conclude my talk. Hey, regarding the structure, you may all know this is when a single gate transistor so with the single silicon nanowire phase. As you can see, we have gate and the oxide. This is the nanowire with the diameter of D and the distance between the nanowires. We have the substrate and the gate divided by the number of nanowires, which we call it unit cell. I mean the unit cell, the width, we have one single nanowire. With these two, three parameters, I think it will be very easy to follow this presentation. And again, the main point is we want to know what is the optimum D here between the nanowires to get better DC and AC performance. And this is what I mean with this Double gate structure, it is the substrate. We have same oxide down and the same gate, like this top gate. 
and people around the structure. Again, we are considering the scale around the structure as a reference since this is called like ideal device because of better channel control. And another point is, for example, in this kind of a structure, when we are talking about this nanowires parallel to each other, there is electrostatic interaction between them. But for example, here, if we put another such a device next to this one, because of this metal shielding, there is no electrostatic interaction between them. So in this view, we may conclude, okay, this is the best structure to get higher performance, but end of this presentation, we will conclude this is the structure which should be the last option from not only BC, but from B, also AC performance point of view. <clears throat> okay, with this one, this is this, the device fabricated device we actually received from the Infineon. The channel length is around 90 nanometer. And we simulated this structure and we compared all, this is the ticket result, the line compared with the experimental data. The symbols are showing the experimental data for this device. With such an agreement, we can see for transfer. We have the same fitting with the output characteristics. With this kind of simulation and fitting it to the experimental data, we call it kind of TCAT calibration. That means we can say or oh, TCAT simulation. It is somehow representing this device and even the technology. And we did the same thing also for this external transit frequency, as we can see this FT with the VG from the experimental data and compared to the TCAT simulations. <clears throat> as you can see, depending on the parasitic capacitances, first of all, we can extract the parasitic capacitance for the fabricated device, and we can see this the parasitic capacitances around the value which we extracted and continuing the same procedure for the Fmax, again from the measurement and fitting the ticket simulations to the experimental data. Again, we are extracting this gate contact, the gate resistance and with this kind of fitting ex experimental data to the TK simulation, what you say we are claiming the simulation is calibrated to the measurement using BC and AC performance. Now we are using this calibrated TK simulation, which it is somehow representing the technology. And we are showing if we fabricate this kind of different devices within the same technology, then what kind of performance, DC, AC performance we can extract. So this was supposed to be my <clears throat> backup slide, but just wanted to show here when I am talking about the gate, it clearly to show what does gate width means. As you can see here, if the gate width is like 12 nanometer here, almost same then nanometer diameter, or if it is 50 or if it is 100 nanometer, this gate width. As you can see, the gate width has influence on the IV characteristics. I will explain why it is happening and what is the consequence. And same thing again with this, the distance between the nanowires. As you can see, depending on the distance between nanowires, we can have very dense nanowires or very, <clears throat> we can increase or decrease the number of nanowires per gate width. With this production, again, I will, sorry, what we see here, this is 
the current per one single nanowire, the transfer characteristics, and this is, we are talking about one single nanowire. If we look at the current from gate neuron, as it is, as it is expected to be like ideal device, and we are seeing very huge current compared to here, for example, I have shown the current for one single gate. As we can see in the single gate transistor, depending on this unit cell, if we decrease the unit cell, or if we decrease the distance between the nanowires, we see that current for one single nanowire is decreasing. So from this point, we may immediately conclude, okay, forget about this kind of structures with this kind of distance, just this is the perfect structure, but that is not the only parameter. We also need to consider another parameter, which is nanowire density. When we are decreasing this unit set, when we are decreasing the distance between the nanowires, that is right, the current is decreasing. But another parameter is the number of nanowires, which is increasing per gate width. We need to put these two parameters next to each other, then conclude what is happening for DC AC performance of the device per gate, this gate width. And again, the main question is here, what is the optimum distance between the nonwires? And in order to get the answer for this question, based on the simulation, we are showing the current. Again, this is for one single nonwire in the single gate or double gate transistor. This is normalized to the gate around the structure. And here we are seeing the unit set divided by the diameter of the nanowire. What we see here, if we decrease the unit set from this point up to somewhere like this four times D, the unit set, you see the current is almost fixed, but starting from this point, we see the critical unit set is around 4D. This means starting from this point, if the unit set is, for example, here, if it is 1D, and this means if the distance between nanowires is zero, what is the consequence? This current is almost 50% less. It is the same scenario for the charges. I'm not showing in this presentation, but in the paper, in the previous slide, we show that in the previous slides, all these figures together with the charge are published in this paper. And again, if we just consider this current per single nonwire, probably we, again we will conclude, forget about this kind of unit cell here because the current is very low. So the best option would be somewhere here. But again, I, I am going to conclude exactly opposite because of when we are selecting the unit set, very small unit set, or let's say the distance between nanowire equals zero, that is right, the current or the charge for one single nanowire is decreasing, but considering the number of nanowires or nanowire density per gate width, this is the conclusion. This is actually the total current per gate width, either double gate or single gate, normalize it to the gate around the structure. As we can see, for example, in this case, this is for the double gate structure. If we select this, this smallest unit set, which is exactly the same than the diameter of the nonwire, so that this means the distance between the nonwire is zero. As we can see, we can expect even up to three times more current in double gate transistor or even in the single gate transistor, as you can see, it is again normalized to the gate all around the structure. Both the structures giving better current density compared to 
the gate around the structure, which is supposed to be the ideal structure. Then what I conclude from this, this slide, I will conclude, this is the answer actually for our question. This is the optimum value for the D. So the nanowires, they shouldn't have any distance from each other. Then you can expect this kind of DC characteristics. But what about the AC performance? Whether we would like to have this D as small as possible, or we need to increase this distance between the nanowires. In order to answer this question, again, we can see here, this is the intrinsic gate capacitance with the gate bias. Considering gate all around the structure, this is what we can see for the gate capacitance. And if we consider double gate structure, again, with the unit cell, we can see what is happening for all gate capacitance. Actually, the gate capacitance is decreasing with the unit cell. And here, if the unit cell is 1D, this means the distance between the non-wire is zero, non-wires. We are getting very, the gate capacitance is decreasing. But if we also check the transconductance, this is a transconductance for one single non-wire, Again, gate around structure and double gate transistor with different unit cell V. Again, the transconductance is decreasing. And what is the conclusion or the consequence of this unit cell if we check FT, intrinsic transit frequency, for double gate transistor? with different unit cell. Surprisingly, we can, not surprisingly, the interesting point is FT is not changing with the unit cell well. This means it doesn't matter what is the distance between the nanowires, it is zero or it is like 20 times D. We, are, we can expect the same FTI and the reason is actually, yeah, this is what we I will conclude from here, the distance between the nanowire, it doesn't matter. We will get the same FTI and the reason is what we saw in the previous slides, this parameter, the transconductance is decreasing with the unit cell. Same thing is happening for the gate capacitance, but both of them, they are decreasing in the same rate. And that is the reason we can expect this FTI, which is almost independent or very weakly dependent on D. Then FT is free of this D, distance between the nanowires. But actually for practical application, we are mainly interested in the external transit frequency. And if we consider, if we look at the external transit frequency, this is showing the number of nanowires and this is transconductance and gate, this capacitance, and this is the parasitic capacitances. If we consider one single nanowire, we can see this is going to be attributed this parasitic capacitance for one single nanowire, but with increasing the number of nanowires, suppose instead of one nanowire, if we put 100 nanowires, this parasitic capacitance is going to be distributed between the nanowires. Then again, from FT external point of view, what is the interesting point? We are interested to increase this number of nanowires as much as possible to make the impact of this text this parasitic capacitance is smaller. Okay. This is up to here. Even from AC performance point of view, we conclude this. We are interested in increasing this number of nanowires and decreasing this distance between the nanowires and if possible to make it zero. But here, we also see the impact of different structure actually. We have the same nanowire, but if we consider 
is a three different structure, this gate architecture. And if we check this intrinsic transit frequency, again, what is actually surprising is this single gate structure. As we can see, the single gate structure compared to gate around this structure, it is showing higher FTI and around 30% higher FTI compared to the gate around, which it is supposed to be ideal device. And the reason for and the reason for this increase is actually you know, weaker gate control in the single gate. And this is actually advantage here to have higher carrier velocity and accordingly higher FTI. How this weak gate control result or leading to this higher carrier, carrier velocity, we can see it here. If we look at the quasi Fermi potential through the channel from source to drain, I can simply show maybe the next this slide, what, where I am showing just, this is the slide I show at the beginning. We are looking at this red ball at this point from source to drain and we are seeing what is happening for this quasi Fermi potential. And I have actually selected this poem, not only the single gate, double gate and gate all around. This is the point far from this gate, in the single gate, we have weaker channel control. And we want to see what is happening with this weaker channel control, then we can, we can generalize it because the average control in this structure compared to this structure would be weaker. Then conclusion will work for entire device. Okay. Again, if we look at this quasi Fermi potential, and if we zoom in, we can see in the single gate transistor, this quasi Fermi potential is, the slope is more than for gate all around the structure. And this is because in the gate all around the structure here, we have much better control. We have more flat Fermi potential here compared to the single gate. And what is the Consequence, consequences, the slope for this device single gate is more than, or the gradient of this potential is bigger than the gate Bigger gradient of potential means electric field in this device is bigger than gate around, and that is leading for higher carrier velocity. Excuse me, doctor. Yes. You have five minutes, please. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, I think I will be able to finish in five minutes. Thank you. And this is what we see for electron velocity is in a single gate due to that this loop and electric field which is higher than gate around, and this is the reason for higher FTI in single gate transistor. So what is the conclusion so far? I would say for DC performance. I would say this double gate structure is the best device with the non wires, which they have zero distance between the dark. There is a zero distance between the non wires, and that will need for actually the nano sheet. Then the conclusion would be to forget about the non wires if you are going to put them with a zero distance. You can simply put nano sheet, and this is the this structure for from DC point of view, and this is then would be the single gate transistor, and this should be the last option, the choice from DC performance point of view. And regarding this AC performance, the single gate the single gate structure with zero distance between non wires, which it will lead for non machine, would be the best option then double gate and finally this gate around structure. As I mentioned, from both DC and AC performance point of view, as you can see, this should be the last option when we are talking about device performance per gate width. 
So the question at the beginning was, what about this? Optimum distance here, we will say, then we could answer this one. It is zero distance and instead of parallel nanowires, we should use one single nanosheet here. And with this one, I can't conclusion. The conclusion is when we are talking about this parallel nanowires, the screening effect is there and the screening effect is this interaction between the electrostatic and for this screening effect, not only the distance between the nanowires, but also gate arrangement, different structures play great role. And from RF performance point of view, I would say the single gate transistor, not with a bunch of nanowires, but the nanoship is the best option to get the best RF performance from such a devices, and this would be the last option. From DC performance point of view, double gate, sorry, that is double gate with the nano sheet would be the best option. And another advantage of this nano sheet would be from fabricating point of view. If you are going to fabricate nano sheet instead of nano wires, you know, for the nano wires, this technology people, they need to think about the alignment, the size of the nano wires, their exact distance. But if we just consider nano sheet, the fabrication would be free of all these kind of challenges. And that's all from my side. Thank you for your attention. If any questions, comments, then this was there. Thank you, Dr. Narmani. Congratulations for your ex excellent presentation. I have a, a couple of questions. Yeah. First, which are the best FT and FMAX reported by FATs based on nanowire so, so far? Regarding this, I actually have no idea about the best because depending on the different structure, different dimensions, or even different again, the structure and material parameters, definitely we will expect different. And I don't know what is the state of the art, but the idea of this study was to, to show, actually, the show at the beginning, the idea was, or the main point was to show here, whether we are going to fabricate this kind of device with parallel array of nanowires or, or again, what about the optimum distance between the nanowires? This was the main point I wanted to actually answer. And regarding, again, this question, I would say, what is the state of the art for these nanowires in terms of FT or FMAX? Okay, thank you. The next question is, have you considered the impact of traps within the oxide in the simulation? Can you comment on that? And two, how different will be the transport in a vertical GAA from a horizontal GAA? The first question is regarding whether we consider traps at okay, We didn't consider the traps in the simulations. And sorry, the next question was. The next question is how different will be the transport in a vertical GAA from a horizontal GAA? This yes. Is yeah, okay, I know the question. Again, depending on the structure, I would say, and if it is good. Well, let's say in this way, the main point is, I would say, the same thing can be applied for, doesn't matter, lateral or vertical stuff. If the question is regarding whether you should use the nanowires or nano sheet. I would say exactly the same thing we can apply for vertical devices, vertical nanowires. But if 
we are talking about different structure. If we are talking about not, for example, silicon nanoparticles and other devices like hemp or gallium nitride, mm, I think we need to exactly simulate this same structure. I mean, one exactly the same structure with the same material, then only we can show exactly what is happening for the FT. The general conclusion we can apply, we can say even for vertical nanowires, even for other devices like hemp, nanoshape would be preferable than nanowires, but in order to address the exact FT, FMAX, or all other performance, we need to simulate exactly the same structure, then only accurately we can see what is the difference between FT, FMAX, or any other performance. Thank you for the answer. The next question we have from the chat is, by decreasing the gate control, you may increase the leakage current. Have you analyzed the impact of the leakage gate current on the device performance? Why you expect lower leakage in the single gate? Because if you talk about the main difference between single gate and gate around, I would say the main advantage of this gate around actually is actually because of the short channel devices, short channel to control short channel effect. I wouldn't say the leakage column because the leakage column would be just oxide thickness and from the oxide, if you are talking about gate leakage, if I can show the structure, I would expect exactly same gate leakage here. If this is the single gate transistor, and we have the same oxide thickness here, and if we compare it with this gate on the round, if we have exactly the same oxide thickness in gate on the round and single gate, I would expect exactly because here in this region we have same control if we compare the single gate and here. And if you're talking about this gate leakage here, leakage current, I would expect exactly the same leakage current. And from opposite side, where we have lower gate control, I wouldn't expect any gate leakage current. If it answers the question. Okay, thank you. The next question uh, we have from the chat is, have you analyzed analyze the influence of the nanowire diameters? Actually, no, no, not, no, we did not within this study, I didn't consider the frame diameters here because it was already too much information for this work. No, we didn't. I, this for different diameters. In this device, in this study, it was around, I think, 12 nanometer. And all the results I have shown here, it is for this one single diameter around 12 nanometer. Thank you, doctor. Dr. Eloy, have you any question? Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Fontes. Uh, just to say, uh, uh, Dr. Gadar, a pretty nice presentation. Just uh, a question, which are the main issues to be overcome to achieve the ultimate high frequency performances in these technologies? In this technology? Uh, uh, nanowire field effect transistors. Okay, maybe based on the simulation, as I showed here, probably this would be what I would say regarding the best choice of the structure. If again, from here, I would say, I wouldn't go to this structure or get around the structure. Mm -hmm. It's based on the theory, what theory shows, it is showing the single gate structure and forget about again, 
bunch of nanowires or parallel nanowires if for AC performance. I would, yeah, we will select a single gate transistor and again, not nanowire, no parallel nanowires, either in lateral or vertical, this would be the best option. Using, and that is the reason I will not talk about any nanowires if we are talking about this RF perform, even DC, just single gate and nano sheet. This should be the ultimate, I would say, okay. performance we can get from these devices. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have one last question yeah. from the chat. You say by silicon sheet, you mean silicon? Sorry? And the question say this, the silicon sheet, you mean silicon? Sorry, I cannot get the point. What is silicon what? The silicon sheet, you mean silicon? Yeah, I don't know if I could understand the question actually. Okay. Silicon is a two dimensional version of silicon, is okay. what they say in the chat. Oh, Or maybe even we can talk after. if you can write me the question, we can discuss even bit after the session. Yeah, I think that's okay. If we can you can write me the question because right now even I cannot find there is this chat to see the questions, then I will answer in the actually. Okay, we will send you the question. Um, yeah, if you can say that would be very good. Yes, it's no problem. Okay, any other question, Dr. Eloy? No, thank you. I didn't think thank you so much okay. for having me. Thanks. Thank you to you, Dr. Gadar. Okay. Um, I don't know if they can see the next slide. Yes. Okay. And the National Polytechnic Institute, through the Eugenio Mendez de Curacher, grant the present acknowledgement, acknowledgement to the Gather Darbandi for your participation in the webinar High Frequency and Terahy Device and Circuits Perspectives on Emerging and Advanced Technologies, Part 2 with the conference RF performance analysis of nanowires and nanosheets in single gate, double gates and gate all around FATs held on November 26 and 27, 2020. Thank you, Dr. Gather. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, and the next presentation is from the Dr. Engineer Aníbal Uriel Pacheco Sánchez. Aníbal Pacheco received the Dr. Engineer degree in electrical and computer engineering from the Technische Universität Dresden Chair for Electron Device and Integrate circuits, Germany in 2019, and the Master Science degree in Telecommunication Engineering and Bachelor Engineering degree in Telecommunication and Electronics from the National Polytechnic Institute, Mexico in 2011 and 2009, respectively. Since April 29, he worked as a postdoctoral research in the Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona, Spain. His present research interests involve 
the characterization, parameter, extraction, compact and numerical modeling of emerging transistor technologies, statics and dynamical perform dynamic performance with channel of one and two dimension. In 2007, he was a visiting scholar in Texas A&M University in U USA in the Analog and Mixed Signals Center. From 2010 to 2011, he was a research assistant in the graduate studies and research section, CEPI Telecom of the Electrical and Mechanical Engineering Superior School, uh, the CIME, IPN. From 2011 to 2012, he lectured course in Telecommunication Engineering Academic in CIME, Mexico. From 2017 to 29, he worked as a research associate in the TU Dresden, Germany. He has supervised two visiting scholars from IPN, Mexico, in TU Dresden and in the Autonomous University of Barcelona in 2018 and 2019, respectively. During his time as PhD research associate, he was a guest research in the device modeling group in the Center of Advanced, Advancing Electronics Dresden, where he worked towards the development of a rough carbon nanotube electronics. He supervised three bachelor theses and two master theses from TU Dresden student. Current, currently, he also collaborated with CEPI Telecom and IPN as an external research where he has co-supervised two master theses and tier one to be finished in early 2021. Dr. Pacheco has authored and co-authored 16 papers and peer review journal and 13 papers in refereed conference proceeding. He has been invited a speaker in the Cathedra Eugenio Mendez de Curro in 2017 and 29. Dr. Pacheco? Yes, I'm here. Yes, you yeah. have the microphone. You had 13 minutes for the presentation. And after that, we'll have 15 minutes for question, please. Okay, you can, can you see start, my slides please? already? Yeah. Can you see my screen yes. already? Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this nice presentation. Um, so after looking at the title of my talk in the flyer, I realized that I was being a little bit too ambitious. So I'm not a technology guy. I'm, I'm not telling you exactly how to build an RF emerging transistor. I'm more an RF device modeling and characterization researcher. And I just want to share with you uh, the findings of uh, experimental and theoretical study of traps during these last years in Dresden and Barcelona. Before starting with the technical stuff, I would like to give special thanks to, organizing, to the organizing committee of this event, um, to all the speakers who took, to, who took their time to prepare the slides and share all the present research they are developing in different parts of the world. Thank you very much for accepting this invitation. And finally, but not least, I would like to thank all the colleagues I have collaborated with um, to achieve this experience in traps in one dimensional and two dimensional fets that I'm going to share with you now. So I started this study at uh, TU Dresden, Professor Michael Schroeder. Uh, in which also I collaborated with some people in NABLAV to perform some uh, measurements there. And uh, during the last couple of years, uh, I expanded this study with the group of Professor David Jimenez at uh, UAB, uh, with uh, my colleagues uh, Nicolas Mavredakis and Pedro Feijó, who also gave some talks yesterday, with the collaboration of uh, the group from Henry Happy at the University of Lille. So, Thanks, all of you. This is the technical agenda of my talk. I would start giving you the state of the art of the RF emerging transistor technologies, 
which I will identify here as one-dimensional FETs and two-dimensional FETs, depending on the dimension of the channel. So then I will mention some devices and challenges, that, device issues and challenges that we find in these devices. Um, what is stopping them to uh, produce reliable RF applications, or at least some of the issues, maybe not all of them. Then I will uh, give you a general overview through experimental results of the traps, traps impact on the device performance on DC and especially on RF um, uh, scenarios. Uh, I will talk a little bit about modeling of traps, how to deal with trap affected devices nowadays because we can live with them. Um, yeah, then I summarize my talk later. So let's define the RF emerging transistor technologies that we are going to talk about in this uh, presentation. What I call one dimensional uh, field effect transistors consist of carbon nanotube field effect transistors and nanowire uh, FETs. So maybe uh, Gather can see now why I asked regarding the vertical um, nanowire FETs. Anyway, uh, CNT FETs, and the first on the on the top part of the slide, um, they are built with parallel carbon nanotubes in the channel, which diameter can be of one or two nanometers, and the length of them depends on the technology. It, it can be uh, produced um, in a in a way that it's so short as six nanometers or even a few micrometers. So it has been claimed that uh, there is an inherent one-dimensional transport in these uh, materials. So you have a reduced scattering probability within the channel of these devices. And theoretically, it has been predicted a linearity in, at a device level, which is quite important in RF systems. Um, uh, RF CNT FETs are generally built with multitude channel, just so you can reduce the output impedance with a top gate architecture and a high K oxide uh, separating the channel from the gate. Um, Nanowire field effect transistors, on the other hand, uh, well, they resemble somehow the CMT FETs, but uh, the nanowires are not hollow cylinders, are CMTs, they are bulk cylinders, and the nanometers of these nanowires are, are short, but not as short as nanotubes. So they are around six to 20 nanometers, like the shortest I have seen. Um, one dimensional or quasi ballistic transport is also predicted for these. And um, the RF devices that I have seen in this nanowire technology correspond to three, five multi-wire channel <clears throat> in, the, in a way that the channel is vertical. That's, that was my second question to gather, because in the literature, I have found experimental results for this kind of devices. Um, also, they need a high permittivity oxide to separate the channel uh, from the gate. Now, when we talk about two-dimensional uh, FETs, we uh, refer to devices who, uh, which have like uh, 2D materials as a channel. The 2D materials have a strong uh, longitudinal covalent bounds and weak perpendicular van der Waals bounds. So they are quite attractive to be used as a channel in, 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 in FET devices. There are plenty of 2D materials nowadays being researched. They can be used as an insulator, as semiconductors, metals, or semi-metals. But particularly for this talk, we focus on the two-dimensional materials that have been used or have been experimentally proven to work in the RF regime, namely graphene FETs, molybdenum FETs, and black phosphorus FETs. They have an ultra-thin channel. They have also a multi-finger top gate structure as the one shown here. However, I have to say that our colleagues from Lille have demonstrated back gate structures suitable for RF performance as well. 
and they are candidates uh, to be built over bulk or flexible substrates. So they are quite interesting also for flexible electronics. And another, well, one characteristic that they share with the other devices we have shown is that they need a high permittivity oxide. Now, I would love to give you more details about all these devices, but uh, don't take me wrong, you can, you can, you can, you can read them in, in books or papers. And what I wanted to show you is um, these two plots. These two plots uh, gathered the experimental results of fabricated devices from the different technologies I just mentioned you. Uh, we, have, we have here the extrinsic transit frequency over channel length and the maximum oscillation frequency in an extrinsic uh, manner uh, over the channel length for these different technologies. The extrinsic figures of merits are the ones that are interesting for circuit applications because when you build these devices in a monolithic way, all the parasitic contributions that are going to be there are the extrinsic ones. So the intrinsic give you a um, clear idea of the material capabilities, but they are not translated directly into RF applications. So please always have a look at the extrinsic transit frequency and maximum oscillation frequency. Okay. Now, the nanowire fits. In this case, I have, sh I have found uh, these outstanding results for a scaled non, uh, three, five nanowire fets. So they show an FT larger than 200 gigahertz and an F max also in the 100 regime of gigahertz. So, but uh, I have not found so many results of them. So I don't know what's the status of the scalability of this technology. And I have not found either wafer scale reproducibility because if we would like to have reproducible circuit applications, we need this kind of technology. So, uh, so I, don't, I don't know if they are uh, like results that are gonna be practical for, for circuits or not. So I put like a, a question mark here. Modidemium diesel five threads appear here in the middle of the plots and they show like good scalability trend. However, they don't provide higher FTs, larger, uh, higher than 10 gigahertz, and the F max are also around that number. So uh, they are showing quite discrete results, not so good. BP fits, despite their uh, early stage of the technology, so people started to look at them and the, and the RF uh, capabilities like six years ago, they have shown already results similar to molybdenum, yeah, but uh, with a little bit larger channel length. So let's give them a little bit more of time and I'm sure uh, all these points here are gonna move to the central part of the plots. Um, GFETs and CNTFETs are with no doubt the champions in these technologies if we consider scalability and wafer scale reprodu reproducibility. Some proof of concept devices have already achieved uh, 100 gigahertz for these technologies here. So they are our candidates. What about uh, circuit applications with these technologies? Again, this is, these are results of uh, literature research I have done for my PhD thesis. I have updated it. And if I have not included results from your uh, technology, so sorry, please send me the results and I can include them here. If we have a look on uh, the single stage RF, ampli RF amplifiers, we see here some results for GFETs and CNTFETs. No RF amplifiers have been built with other technology and we can achieve at least 10 gigahertz with GFETs and a few gigahertz with CNTFETs. So there have been demonstrations also of mixers and with more technologies, not only CNTFETs and uh, GFETs, but also with black phosphorus and molybdenum transistors. And actually the up-converted frequency with CNTFETs can reach 
uh, around 50 gigahertz, so it's quite promising as well. In the multipliers case, we only found CNT-FETs and GFETs again results. And in the oscillators, only CNT-FET-based circuits have been demonstrated. So all of them are between one and let's put it in 40 gigahertz. So I think they are suitable for RF. There are still some issues to be solved, but uh, they are working at this stage of the technology level. So the RF technologies with more applications uh, found in the literature, again, experimental results only are GFET and cnt -FETs. There are some uh, ways to improve the performance and some approaches to improve it at an integrated circuit level are two, or at least I know two. Uh, it has been proposed to build an all carbon-based uh, system on chip, either of graphene or CNT, or both of them. Or you can also have hybrid solutions. Hybrid solutions means that you have an emerging technology boosted or supported by silicon technology. They have been proven that this work already for digital applications in computers based on CNT FETs and silicon technology. And there are some proposals as well with graphene and silicon CMOS technology. So there are, there, there, there are good options for these technologies yet. Now let's talk about some device issues and challenges that will affect our RF performance in these devices. Um, uh, let me see if I can move this. Yeah, sorry, it was a disturbing me. Uh, okay, now let's talk about uh, contacts and self-heating first. Let's focus our attention here, please, in this sketch of the cross-section of a 1D or 2D FET, whatever you want. You have here the channel in red, the high permittivity oxide separating the gate and the channel, which is quite important for our study. And below it, I have draw the conduction band diagram at different bias points. This is the conduction band within the channel of the device in one dimension. And um, this is a sketch of the intrinsic compact model of the transistor here. We can identify immediately, immediately two um, phenomena that are going to affect our RF performance. First of all, these resistances here, which are called the contact resistances, are due to the uh, difference between the energy level at the contacts, injecting contacts, and the energy level at the channel here. Do you have a shot key barrier like uh, appearing uh, uh, barrier height here? And in addition to this, the interfacial layers also play a role and put some value on RC. So normally RC in these devices is quite high. And we, there are several papers showing the, the RF performance degradation of RC. Uh, one of them is by us. <laughs> So you can see the difference between considering RC or not considering RC in the intrinsic part of the channel is around 170 gigahertz for the for the for, for a giga for, for a GFET. And as Pedro talked about yesterday, also self-heating play a role. So the drain current, the transport here in the channel, depends on several factors. And one of them is the temperature. So uh, Self-heating of the device can affect uh, also your RF performance. So for example, here you can obtain um, uh, higher values of the maximum oscillation frequency if you, don't, if you uh, lower the self-heating as demonstrated by this dashed line. So this is a study by Pedro and some of these results were presented yesterday. So I just wanted to mention that uh, this these phenomena are important in, 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 in these devices. But my main discussion here is around traps, because normally trap effects are overlooked in the RF performance of these devices. So let's define traps. Traps, it's a material or energetic dependent imperfection in the channel or its surroundings able to capture and release carriers at a certain time, that's important as well. So again, we have the cross section of our device here. Below it, I have uh, draw the, again, the conduction band diagram, but just at one bias point. This 
energy conduction band depends, among other factors, on the channel potential, which I draw here below. So this is important for my next discussion. We can identify different trap centers within our, within our device. First, we have imperfections in the channel and the interfaces. Uh, we have also uh, oxide defects close to the channel, and we have deep oxide defects. All of them have different time constants to capture and to emit uh, carriers. <laughs> and they differ between technologies as well. So let's see what happens when you have traps here. They shield the channel potential. How they shield it? This is uh, a, a, a moment in which these traps here, sorry, here is a zoom of this region of the channel below the gate. And here the traps are uh, empty. So all the field, line, field lines coming from the gate are affecting directly the channel potential. However, at some point, then the traps are filled with carriers here. So the field lines are not arriving directly to the channel potential. So you have an affected channel potential here. If you have uh, traps within uh, this oxide, or trap, uh, traps filled within this oxide, and uh, your gate control is reduced. So the current transport conditions have changed. This is uh, resulting in uh, a bias point shift, so for example, your threshold voltage is shifted. So before showing some experimental results, uh, including these effects that I just mentioned, let me present you some device characterization techniques that I am going to mention along this, the next slides. First of all, we have the standard staircase non-pulse measurement technique. In this case, to apply a, in a staircase-like scenario the voltage signals. So you apply first, for example, one pole, then you go to 1.5 and so on. The, the current is measured at the end of the poles. However, you can see that the, if the current is affected by traps, it's going to be diminished. And at some point, of course, there are going to be a steady-like state, but it could be that it is not reached by this time step. And if it is not reached, then this trap state would affect the next one, and the next one, and so on. And that results in a, in a trap-affected behavior, if you, if you characterize your devices with this, with this scheme. The measurement setup for this is not challenging at all, and it's useful to give you an idea uh, of the initial conditions of your devices. Again, non uh, another non-pulse technique, but a little bit more reliable in terms of trap reduced performance in, is an opposing sweep technique. So you kind of erase the measurement history. So you uh, counter the charging at one point with the uncharging of the traps at the other step by applying uh, consecutive voltage signals with similar magnitude but different size. This can give you a uh, trap reduced uh, performance of your device. And the most accurate characterization technique are pulse measurements. So this resembles like PWM, for example, and it depends on different factors, on the duration of the pulse, on the frequency of the pulse, and also on the pulse width. And um, this can give you um, um, trap reduced performance, like more accurate than this one and it is useful for precise characterization of your devices. So let's see the trap impact on real devices. You can, uh, or people is looking at hysteresis just to see if their device is affected or not. Hysteresis is basically just an operating point drift. Let's have a look at this, plot, this transfer characteristic of a CNT FET that uh, I have measured like five years ago or so. And the lines represent non-pulse measurements, and the symbols represent uh, um, opposing sweep measurements. So you can see that in the non-pulse measurements, you have a hysteresis voltage window here. So that means that your traps are starting to be filled when you apply a four-bar sweep, when you start from minus two to two. And at some point, you want to test what happens if you apply a backward sweep from two to minus two. So 
the traps are filled here, they continue to be filled at the change of the sweep direction. That's the reason why the drain current at the backward sweep is lower than the drain current at the forward sweep. But at some point, that changes. And that changes, that change means that you have uh, your traps already emitting at this bias point and after a certain time. You can see that at high uh, drain voltages, even with the uh, opposing sweep, you can see a little bit of hysteresis. So uh, traps impact more at higher fields. You can always say that if you don't have hysteresis width, then you don't have traps. Let's have a look at this GFET that we measured in March or February. Um, in our lab in uh, UAV, and you can say we, it, this was with non-pulse measurements. So you can say, okay, we don't have hysteresis with you. We don't have a difference between forward and backward sweep. Yeah, okay, but let's have a look at the second order functions of the drain current. If we check then the output conductance, you have quite a difference there. So having a small hysteresis width is not always a good indicator that you have a trap-reduced behavior. Now, the steady or non-steady device response, yeah, because uh, sometimes you, 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 you apply pulse for, for more than 100 seconds and you don't see a steady response, depends on the capture and emission time of the, of the traps. So that's important. There are two important factors that you need to be considered to, to consider. The measurement history also affect traps. And I have seen this in at least in GFET uh, literature. In GFET literature, they always say you apply a pulse, and uh, after some minutes or after some seconds, you uh, you will have a steady state. So you can measure your, your trap free uh, performance over there. However, it's, it, it, it not only depends on how long the pulse is, it also depends on the non-quiescent uh, conditions here. So on the, on the charging or pre-charging of your device, of your, of, your char of your traps here. As I show here, the hysteresis window depends on the dotty cycle and on the pulse width that you're applying. So not only on this, but also on the non-quiescent conditions. Excuse so me, this, Dr. you have yeah. five minutes. Yeah, thank you. And the steady conditions differ, differ between technologies. So you can find this kind of behavior similarly in GFETs, in molybdenum, and black phosphor FETs. Uh, and also between different technology uh, generations, you can have this kind of, 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 of effect. As I said, the trapping processes depend on both quiescent and non-quiescent conditions. We have found out this or demonstrated this with a student back in, in Dresden. And we see first here the blue curve, it's non-pulse measurements, no, sorry, staircase measurements, uh, opposing sweep uh, characterization, sorry. And then we apply a different non-quiescent condition my, from zero volts to minus two volts. That gives us the red curve here. The hysteresis windows is quite short. However, when we change not only the, the, the pre-charging condition, but also the pulse width, then we obtain our expected trap reduced performance. So everything plays a role here. Um, we need to know uh, the time constant of our uh, capture and emitting processes. So how this impact the RF performance? You can say, because I have only shown you DC uh, results, but whenever you are characterizing uh, RF response of these active devices, you need this Bias T. Bias T is just a splitter, so it splits the DC signal that it is affected by traps and the RF signal. They are mounted together. So, okay, people say RF signal is not affected by traps because they are faster than that. Yeah, I agree on that if you have an, uh, a passive device. But if you have an active device, the bias shift that I showed you before, it's going to affect your measurement. How they affect the apparent linearity? So apparent linearity is basically obtaining a pure 
signal at the end of uh, of your device at the output of your device if you don't have an uh, a good a good inherited then you have some products and that's going to consume you power that's critical for lna pa and mixers and there is there are some studies saying that inherent linearity is possible in carbon nanotubes and graphene field effect transistors i have studied this one the first one but not the second one so uh, and i put here really because uh, i'm not sure if this is really happening i explain you why so the apparent linearity can be uh, monitored by a constant GM. So people are saying, for example, in scientifics that you have a, a, a constant GM, then you have a good linearity there. These are results with non-pulse measurements. However, when you measure the same device with pulses, then this apparent linearity disappears. That's because the AC response of consecutive, consecutive non-pulses corresponds to the same internal bias point because of the shielding we talked before. So this apparent linearity cannot be exploited in circuits at all. <clears throat> the actual linearity only reveal, it's only revealed with trap reduced characterization. So always apply this kind of characterization when you are talking about RF performance as well. Let's go back to our study on graphene. They show here the IAPP3 measure and they show the one model and they don't agree at all. And they actually accept that they have not included traps. So they are accepting that they have traps, but they don't compare them. They don't compare the IP3. So uh, I'm not saying that it is wrong, but I put a question mark on this. Okay, you can, you can prove it if you model uh, the traps in GFETs. And that's uh, part of uh, my next step in the work. So how the traps impact the high frequency performance of different devices is shown here. Uh, the transit and maximum oscillation frequency of CNT feds is altered by traps. This, the, the solid line is with non-pulse measurements, the other with pulse measurements. You can see a difference not only in bias, but also in magnitude in both cases. The same has been shown for GFETs and also for vertical nanowires. So all these that have high K oxide, including traps, they uh, show this uh, non-optimal behavior. What about the trap modeling? This in my last min minute. So you need to, to model it because the traps are everywhere, especially in warfare scale processes. It helps you to, to evaluate your technology and understand experimental observation. And for these early applications, we need this modeling. And I show you next quickly the approaches that we are using to model these uh, traps. The first one is to include the trap effect in the charge definition. And this nice work by Fran, our colleague at UAB, and some colleagues at Granada, they include the, the trap modeling here in the charge definition. And we took this idea and apply it to the devices we measure from Lille. And we obtain a good model that fits both the non-pulse measurements and pulse measurements here. And we are able also to produce for the first time a direct, a trap affected direct voltage in, in GFET uh, as a function of BDS here for, for, for non-pulse and pulse measurements. We also obtain the trap density with this study. So this model is quite useful for explaining this. And if you include the, a module in your compact models, you can actually reproduce pretty well the performance of non-pulse and pulse measurements as we shown here in CNT feds. And we revealed that the apparent linearity reported before at least for CNT feds was just um, a shielded potential. So an effect of the traps. So that actually I wanted to do the same for GFETs in my uh, next step of the work. Uh, with, uh, I, I just mentioned this, sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm, I know that I'm over time. Um, there are some techniques to characterize the capture and emission processes available in the literature, but they are, they are suitable for devices which have a bulk contact. In this one dimensional, two dimensional, you don't have a bulk contact. So you need to propose different approaches. And that's what we have proposed here in this paper that it is on their uh, review right now. I wanted to show you the real results, but okay, I show you the models. So actually these are monitoring results, uh, but we have uh, obtained for the first time both trap capture and trap emission processes in CNTFETs and this characterization can be used 
in other uh, emerging devices. I finished my talk, how to live with traps? Can we, can we avoid them? From, there are some solutions from the technology groups. They can passivate their devices, encapsulate their devices, uh, propose different outsides, but there is a long way for a trap-free RF uh, emerging device. From the characterization point of view, you can adequate your conditions to reduce the trap impact, and you can already exploit these biasing conditions, for example, in high data rate communications with pulse-based modulation schemes. The wrap-up of my, device, of my <laughs> talk is that uh, I hope I convince you by showing experimental data that 1D and 2D FETs are suitable for high-frequency applications. And there are traps still in devices and wafer scale technology of, uh, of these uh, emerging uh, nanotransistors. The standard measurements show a linearity which cannot be exploited in RF circuits. The opposing sweep and pulse measurements can reveal measured trap behavior, but the hysteresis width is not the best indicator that you have a trap reduced behavior. Trap in animation time constants are required to get a steady state condition. Quiescent and non-quiescent conditions are important, not only holding time, please. And it can be useful for correct evaluation. Um, we need compact model for early applications. Technical, technological solutions are, we are, are gonna be available soon, and we can exploit the trap reduced biasing condition at this stage of the technology if we apply the correct uh, pulses. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Pacheco Sanchez, great presentation. Now we'll have some question. And Dr. Eloy, if you have one question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fontes. Um, first of all, uh, Dr. Pacheco, thanks for this uh, presentation. There is a lot of uh, uh, measurements and data. It's quite normal to take more time than predicted. So I have just a question um, regarding the strategies to avoid the apparition of, of these traps. Can you detail a little bit more these uh, techniques, please? Yeah, sure. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> Here, for example, so uh, let's go to the pulse measurement scheme. So basically, during this time, this non-quiescent time, you are uh, maybe applying a voltage in which your traps are gonna be, um, so the carriers in the traps are gonna be released. So this is to empty your traps, for example. And then you apply a short pulse that it is shorter than the capture and emission time, and you measure uh, your response at the end of this short pulse. So you can sure, you can be sure that this is a trap free behavior or trap reduced behavior because there are always gonna be traps in there. And the other option, uh, this is quite challenging actually to, to have in a laboratory, especially in RF characterization. For RF characterization, actually you can uh, get use of this opposing pulse technique because you just need your normal SMU, your bias T's, and your VNA. And in your SMU, you apply opposing pulses. And basically, the previous pulse um, not unfills the traps, but erases the measurement history you had before. So basically, put, it puts the state of your traps at the same level. That's the reason why hysteresis is reducing. So that, those are the characterization techniques and that's why I'm saying you can get advantage of this because those seem like uh, telecommunications modulation schemes. And there are already some demonstration of QAM and PSK uh, systems with graphene by applying this kind of uh, modulation schemes. Okay, thank you. And what about uh, the slide entitled uh, Living Without um, Traps? Again, can you detail a little bit more about uh, this slide, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so there are, 
there is a work that appeared last year here in Nature Electronics showing that you can produce only denim diesel five fats and with a back gate oxide made out of uh, calcium and fluoride. So basically, this lowers the defects at the interface between your two-dimensional channel and your back gate oxide, which is quite promising. And I have seen the results. There is no stereotype at all here. And, and this is something that we um, can exploit if and only if this technology, this fluoride calcium is produced also for top gate uh, architectures because those are the most suitable architectures for high frequency uh, devices. So if we have already a uh, top gate architecture and you passivate or encapsulate your channel, you can reduce also the traps at the interface, but the traps at the oxide are still an issue over there. So I'm not an expert on technology. I'm just saying that there are some solutions. And I mean, we have investigated this maybe in a time in the last 10 years. So let's give them time from the technological point of view. From the characterization point of view, you can always characterize the adequate conditions at which your poles will give you trap-free performance. You can provide this information along with your compact model to the circuit designer and tell him, use this device in this circuit with these biasing conditions. So they can take advantage of the really impressive properties of the devices and not trap affected properties. Uh, yeah, that's what I can say uh, besides the high data rate communication systems that I already mentioned. Okay, thank you so much. Well, uh, uh, thank you. We have to one question. Excellent presentation. Go thank ahead, you. Dr. Fontes. Yes, we have one question from the chat from Dr. Dark Bandy. In this slide number 24, this considering RC to capture traps behavior in the device lead to a compact model or numerical model? Thank you. This is in a compact model. So basically you have your uh, compact model that I show here and you have a module, a different module for traps, not in numerical device simulation, at a compact model already. So you can actually characterize your capture time by one RC network and your emission time by, by, the, by, by a second one. And you can have several RC networks depending on uh, the trap behavior you see. So for example, maybe you just don't have one capture time constant, maybe you have two. And that's what uh, we have actually obtained here with Christophe uh, before, sorry. Anyway, you can produce different RC networks and with those RC networks, you can obtain a given BTR, uh, 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 a trap related voltage that's gonna be uh, injected into a node here in your compact model and reproduce your non-pulsed uh, performance here. So uh, if you would like to, 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 to reproduce this with numerical device simulations, you can always include the, 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 the trap function in your continuity equation, or maybe you can also mimic this, uh, um, this approach uh, by our colleagues in which you uh, put together with the quantum capacitance and interfacial capacitance due to defects, for example. Thank you very much, Dr. Pacheco, alumni from the National Polytechnical. Uh, now we have, uh, before we pass to the next conference, we have this recognition from, for the Dr. Pacheco, the National Polytechnical Institute through the Eugenio Mendez de Curro Share grant this recognition to Aníbal 
Uriel Pacheco Sánchez. For your participation in the high frequency and terahertz device and circuits. Perspectives on emerging and advanced technology online seminar part two. Thank you very much, Dr. Pacheco. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Now, the next conference is from the Dr. Ferran Paredes. Um, Ferran Paredes was born in Badalona, Barcelona, Spain. In 1983, he received the telecommunication engineering diploma specializing in electronics and the telecommunication engineering degree from the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona in 2004 and 2006, respectively. Later, he received the PhD degree in electronics engineering from the same university in 2012. His thesis was awarded by the Institute de Studies Catalans, Rafael Campalan Prize. He's currently working in Cimitec as a postdoctoral research, and he has been also teaching electronics in the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona since he started his PhD in 2008. His research interests mainly radio frequency identification <coughs> technology and system metamaterials meta meta concepts antennas and passive microwave device, among others. Dr. Ferran Paredes, you have the next 13 minutes for your presentation, and next we'll have some question after that. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, can, it's you, okay. can you see my screen also? Yes, it's ready, it's okay. okay. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here to attend to this seminary and as well as to, to, to do this talk in this Catedra Eugenio Mendez do Curro. So today I'm going to talk about the chipless, uh, chipet and chipless RFID. And, and I'm going to, to, to talk about the state of the art and, and, and applications. So this is the, the outline. So uh, first of all, we talk about the conventional radio frequency identification. I don't know if you, you know that, that terms, but I'm going to talk very briefly about that. Then I will talk about the different approaches about chipless RFID. It's a kind of uh, specific uh, chipless. Then I will talk about the proposed approaches that we have been carried out in our group. And, and then some, some particular solution, which is this synchronous chipless, and then the conclusions. So, okay. So radio frequency identification is a major technology in the field of identification. There are more than 3,000 applications, even more, I guess, including logistics, item and pallet tracking, fair collection, pharmacy, and so on. Actually, radio frequency identification is allocated in different frequencies. For example, low frequency, high frequency, ultra high frequency, and microwave. So we are focused on this, this frequency band. Later, I will see why. But let me tell you that, well, this is low frequency. It's the, the distance of operation is low, like from two up to five centimeters. This is the, the frequency band. Um, basically, it's the principle of operation is magnetic. Uh, the next frequency, high frequency, it's, it works at 30.56 megahertz. Um, the distance has increased, although they are still, still low. And this is a very common, common band because NFC, near field communications, works indeed in this frequency. Well, actually, Near field communications is some kind of RFID. So that's why NFC is kind of, of RFID. Well, do you know this, this technology? And before to start talking about this uh, ultra high frequency, let me tell you that there are also another band, the ASM band in microwave, um, is industrial, scientific, and medical band. 
where most of the tags are basically active, which means that they include some battery, and they are used for tolls, vehicles, uh, access control, and so on. But as I mentioned, we we will focus on that 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 frequency range because it is said that uh, ultra high frequency tags, this kind of tags, are the evolution, the natural evolution of the barcodes, with some improvements. For example, long distance um, and so on. And there are, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, um, a bunch of applications where you can use this, including, for example, retail, logistics. So, okay. So this table is a comparison between barcodes, conventional barcodes. They are, they are of course, some evolutions like QR codes, BIFI codes, but, but I, I put here just the barcodes and also the, the passive tags. The, um, the main advantage is basically the range, the red range. Here you can reach up to 20 meters in, instead of the small few centimeters that you can, you can reach with the barcodes. The capacity, it's higher um, with passive up to 96 bits and even more, I think, actually. Uh, I mean, currently. Um, but they are more, 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 more advantages. For example, you can read more than one, one tag at the same time. I think you can read up to 100. It's not the same time, but the, the instant you need to read this, this tag is like microsecond, microseconds or, or, or the order. So it's imperceptible for us. And you can read, as I mentioned, like 100, 100 tags at the same time. You can reprogram all the tags. You can include security. Uh, you don't need, this is important, you don't need a direct line of sight. You don't need the radar pointing or focusing in the, in the tag or the barcode. So it could be in any place, and as well as durability. But however, however, I mean, the main, the main drawback is the cost. That's why RFID cannot compete with cost against the barcode. This is the cost uh, approximately of the barcodes. It's less than one euro cent. And in passive, passive tax, working at ultra high frequency band, uh, important this, this detail, uh, costs like 10, 10, 10 euro cents. And in some products, or some 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 stuff like liquids, liquids or metallic surfaces, you need some specific tags which are more complex, and also they are very expensive. It costs like a hundred times this. I mean, like ten euros or quite similar in, in America, like ten dollars or even more. Okay, so okay. Uh, the main characteristics of the, the, the tag, if you want to design some tag. So basically, the chip is not a design parameter, so you can obtain different different chips. You want the antenna. This is the part of the antenna. This is some matching impedance matching network. This would be the tag. This would be one part of the antenna. This would be the other. So basically, the antenna we want, uh, we want uh, to be electrically small. Low profile is desired because this is some some inlay tag. It's like stick, uh, and you want uh, a long red rays. So basically, basically, here you have the radar which sends some power, and then this would be the tag. It responds by changing its 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 um, internal. It has some switch which is turn it open and turn it close, and then you can get some backscatter about the, the, the data. I mean, the power fit the, um, the chip. And then by changing this switch, you can obtain some backscatter modulated signal. Um, important things. OK, this is not a parameter. So usually designers design the antenna. If it's necessary, if it's required, you can include between some impedance machine networks and then these are the gain of the antenna that you design and the power transmission coefficient. So this, this graph allow you to know if your antenna is good, is a good tag or good antenna or a poor, it would be a poor tag. So uh, as I mentioned, 
Okay, basically, the input impedance of the chip is basically highly capacitive. This is some examples of the impedance of the chip. So the antenna needs to work at the at the at the reactance at at the part where the reactance of the antenna is positive. Here you can see clearly. So this is the antenna self resonance. This is the resonance of the antenna at 50 ohms. So where the reactance of the antenna compensate the capacity of the chip, then we have the maximum transmission coefficient. And then this is where the tack gets the maximum red range, the peak range. This is how it works. And in order to know the, the, um, the distance, the red range, this would be the redder, which sends some power. And, the, and this is some antenna with some certain gain which are these parameters, the power and gain of the radar, which is a specific according to its, its, its country or its location. For example, in Europe is this, this power, and in the United States is this, depending on the country. This term is the threshold power of the chip, the power that needs the chip to wake up. In this case, now they are around minus 17 dBMs. And these, as I mentioned, are the parameters uh, to design the, the, the antenna. So this would be the tag, the antenna of the tag, this would be the chip, and these are the parameters, the gain, as well as the power and transmission coefficient that designers can, can tailor. Okay, so as mentioned, just sum up, the, there are some commercial applications. There are a bunch of different tags of different companies. This could be the passive. It would be specific for metal or liquids, different size as well. And there are also research. For example, we started doing some research some years ago, and we mix the RFID concepts with metamaterials. Basically, metamaterials are resonators or are some kind of structures that we can use the electrically small antennas, the electrically small size in order to be applied to the antennas. And then we can get some, some tags with a um, uh, smaller size than, than conventional, conventional passive tags. Here, there are different words. These are the, the structures. Um, these are done by, by my colleagues. Well, this is the setup that we, we use for measuring uh, some signal generators. And we generate the, the RFID frame, send here. Then the chip is located, I mean, the tag is located inside the TEM cell or some anechoic chamber. And when it receives enough power, it's, it sends some backscatter signal and then we can receive. Well, we also use these metamaterials concepts to design the RFID antenna, but not of the tag, not the, the tag antenna. We designed the antenna of the radar. And in this case, this is for a point of sale, for example, instead of one uh, antenna able to radiate uh, or to work in near field, this we personally call anti-antenna because we can control the radiation, the radiation zone. And for the investi investigation is still done um, mixing uh, RFID plus sensors for measure temperature, humidity, and so on. This is the conventional, but what we focus right now is chipless. What's chipless? So there are some market needs where, where I mean, some applications um, need to alleviate the cost requirements of the chip. And in some specific applications, uh, the chip is, or the price of the tag is so expensive. So we try to, to imp implement some chipless RFID. So it, they don't include the chip and then we can reduce this cost. So it's what I write here. Some chipless RFID can alleviate the cost requirements. But as I mentioned, it's some very specific market niche. The advantages of the chipless RFID can be implemented in flexible substrate, not equate uh, an internet circuit, so the cost is cheaper. And it's completely comp compatible with, with uh, printing process. But the drawbox, the data density, 
the bandwidth as well as the size. You cannot compare a chipless RFID with a chipped or even barcodes. This has to be clear. And there are different approaches. For example, the time, time domain. Some systems work in time domain. Basically, they receive some, some power, some pulsed signal, and then there are some reflections, reflectors. Uh, the reflectors generate some echoes, and then the presence or absence of these reflectors, then we can obtain the ID of the, the tax. For example, this reflector wouldn't be here, so we don't receive any echo. The main, the main limitation, the number of achievable bits is, limi is limited for the, for the size, basically, and as well for the, for the technology. There are also so, some surface acoustic waves systems or tags, which can be included here in time domain, but they are so, so, so expensive. Another approach is basically the frequency domain. In this case, we have, for example, different resonators working at different, different frequencies. They are, they are called spectral signature, okay? Uh, so spectral signature, uh, chipless tags. So basically, you send some, some wideband signal, it's, uh, it's received by the antenna, and if the presence or the absence of these resonators can, after the signal is sent it to the, another the, um, reader, and the presence or the, the, um, the, the presence or the absence of these resonators um, modifies the transmission signal, okay? We can do the same with some resonators and use backscatter instead of including antennas. The main limitation, basically, the, the spectral bandwidth required to accommodate a significant number of bits. If we want to use a huge amount of bits, we need a, a huge bandwidth. And there are also some hybrids, hybrid solutions which includes, uh, in order to increase the bits, they can use more than one, more than one domain. For example, frequency and phase, frequency and bandwidth, frequency and peaks, and that's the idea. You, you, you try to increase the number of bits for for solution. So what we propose in our in our group is basically that we want to increase the data capacity in this time domain achieve. Uh, I mean, we want the, the, the characteristics of the time domain systems we want, but we want to increase the data capacity. We, we want, for example, increase the bit density, which has the frequency domain, but using a single frequency, and we want to keep the, the, the cost. So that's why we propose some specific application near field chipless RFID with sequential reading. And this is what I'm going to explain. And basically, this solution can be printed in conventional paper. Um, I, I show you some, some, some application. I told you this is a very specific uh, market niche. We can use conductive or even organic inks. They can be reprogrammable. Um, and we have implemented this solution, for example, using 3D printing or permittivity contrast, as well as we have a, a synchronous uh, synchronous systems. So I'm going to talk about the, the proposed chipless. So basically, the main advantage is the number of bits is not limited by the bandwidth. So it's limited just for the, for the area uh, that we want to, to use for the tag. And in this case, it's near field system because the red range is sacrificed in favor of high data capacity. So the, the, the working the red distance is very, very, very close. But in some applications, such as secure paper, this is not, a, this is not a, an issue. So in order to avoid, for example, counterfeiting, counterfeiting or copying uh, some document or corporate uh, documents or official documents, we could use this. For example, medical, medical receipts, we can use this in order to avoid copying. In Spain is very typical, uh, some people uh, try to plagiarism the, the, the medical receipts, for example. And this will be the, the working principle. So basically, the, the chipless stack, which is this, consists of a set of identical resonators. All the resonators work at the same frequency, and they are identical. And the encoding is achieved by the presence 
or the absence of these resonant elements. And finally mentioned the bandwidth is virtually null because all the resonators work at the same, same frequency. So basically how it works, we generate here some signal tune, some tune actually, it send it here. This is the sensitive part of the radar. When, I mean, um, the, the signal is sent through this, this sensitive part. When the attack moves uh, over the, the sensitive part, then this signal is modulated according of the presence or the absence of this resonator. So here we receive some amplitude modulated signal. It's uh, quite, quite, quite simple. So then by simple using some envelope detector, we can recover the ID of the attack. This is the, how it works, the, the system. So basically, this is the sensitive part of the reader. When it is alone, when there is nothing, when there is no tag, for example, or there is the absence of the resonator of the tag, and we have transmission at certain frequency. But when we put some resonator on top of that, all the, respond, all the frequency response is shifted down. And instead of having a transmission, we have a notch. And this is the dynamic range. And it's the difference between having a one or zero. So as I said, the difference between the one and zero is the dynamic range. And we have a bandpass configuration, for example, is the, the configuration I showed now, right now. Or there are another approach based on band stop configuration, which is the other way around. So we have a notch. Uh, when we have nothing and when we add some resonator on top of the sensitive part of the radar, all the frequency response is shifted up and then we have transmission. So here you can see different approaches, different uh, resonators. So based on that, we fabricate the radar, the sensitive part of the radar. I mean, this is a, a simple resonator. This is attack. Well, this is at the beginning. We don't have some some linear uh, step motor, so we have some circular, some motor uh, rounded motor, and we implement here all the tags, all the resonators. For example, this code one is one 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 one. Code two is uh, one zero one zero. The presence and the absence, and different codes which were which were measure it and here we obtain the the, the codes we recover the codes so then um as i mentioned uh the codific codification is achieved by the presence or the absence of the resonators and the problem so if we want um a huge number of tags then we will need a huge number of masks masks for each resonator and for massive manufacturation this is a problem so alternative, so one alternative is print all the tags and then reprogram, reprogram try to reprogram, to reprogram this, this, these tags in order to reduce cost. And this is what we did. We uh, implement all the tags, all the resonators, it's one, 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 and then we cut. And by, we cut this, okay. It's, we cut the resonator and then instead of having one, it's a zero. It's not absence, but this resonator doesn't work. So we try to do with some and here obtain different codes. Then we try to put some, I mean, solder the this cut and we recover the initial configuration. So that's why we can program all we can program these tags, or can we reprogram these tags? We still go further, and we try to print all these resonators instead of instead of printing on instead of etching on microwave substrate. We implement in paper, different kind of paper. This is ordinary paper. This is a uh, photography photo photo paper, and using um, silver ink, silver. I mean is uh, ink based uh, on nanoparticles of zinc, of, of silver, sorry. And this other ink is based on organic, on organic ink. This is the conductivity of this silver ink and the organic. 
Then we implement ATP chiplets in a paper and we could uh, obtain the, the ID if we move in that direction or face down, if we move in, in the other, I mean, upward or downward. And we then still to programmate the, the, um, the, the bits by practicing some, some cut. Okay, program cut and reprogram and re and we try to reprogram it by add some ink at the point where we cut and we recover the the, the signal. Okay, okay, sorry. Yes, and we recover the signal. It's a little bit okay. This is what we recover. And finally, with the same with organic ink. At this case, uh, organic ink has a very low conductivity, but even so, we, we achieve uh, the, the functionality. Um, more things we have been doing, uh, we have been done in with these approaches. Basically, increase the density of the of the resonators. This is a high density tag. We achieve a hundred bits in just six centimeters try to implement these tags instead of uh, metal and substrate with, with uh, con permittivity contrast, for example, by practicing whole arise or even arise or even holes. And then by using 3D printing, using different materials and different uh, configurations. But basically, the main, the main, all these, all these things, basically, all these, these resonators, all these uh, tags, um, requires constant velocity. And if there is velocity variations, don't, then we can obtain false reading. And one, one solution for that uh, could be uh, the, the employment of synchronous reading, and that's the last part of this talk, which basically is the same working principle as I mentioned. Okay, uh, it's some signal generator which is sent through some resonator sensitive part, and then by moving the frequency response, we can obtain two different um, states. But because we want synchronous, synchronous, we need at least two sensing elements. So then we need two elements. For example, the red one and the blue one. Here, there are two chains. The chain on the left is the clock. And it's all, I mean, all the, present, all the resonators are present. So every time one of these patches is on top of this resonator, we have to see the, um, the response of this, this, this resonator. And then we could see, uh, I mean, it's, it's synchronous, uh, synchronous uh, system. So here there are all presents, and here it determines the the ID of the tag. Every time. Excuse they... me, doctor. Yeah, you have sorry. five minutes. Okay, perfect. So every time there is a there is a patch, so we have to read if there is or not uh, some some tag here. And finally, this last resonator uh, allows us to know if the tag moves in that direction or in that direction. Because for example, if we, if we move the tag upward, we firstly receive a change on this frequency. But if the tag is moving downwards, this resonator is first um, uh, shifting. So then we, can, we could know if the tag is moving upwards or downwards. Well, this is the sensitive part of the radar. So it's a micro strip transmission line with three resonators. Um, the width of the three resonators are exactly the same in order to keep the, um, the, the same periodicity of the, of the patches of the, of the tag. And, and these are the, the characteristics of, of the substrate. This is the tag. So basically, as I mentioned, there are two, two chains. <coughs> Sorry. The patch on the left are used to determine the clock. And they can be also used to determine the velocity as well the direction. So this would be another application. And the patches on the right give the, the position. 
the presence or the absence give the the id of the of the tag this is the system uh well i don't explain that here instead of one uh pure tune we need three pure tunes it's one for each frequency it's the same principle and we need three de envelope detectors in order to get the the id of the clock id and the redundant signal which is the direction here is the fabrication of the of the tag and here you can see the the reader both top and bottom so for example if we firstly receive the um, i mean the red one is the clock okay and you can see the green is a little bit um this this the um, uh, uh, delay so if we first receive the red and later the green is upward direction then every time we have the the red signal the clock we have to see the position the blue one it's one one zero zero one is one one zero zero one and this tag was was moved at, at 10 millimeters per second and here, another example, in this case, the tag was moving downwards. So we first received the green signal and we, we, we were accelerating with a decreasing accelerating. And why can we use this, this system? So we can apply this system to the motion control. Uh, for example, some, some sensors can be used in order to measure position, velocity, I mean, uh, basically, these systems are focused on, on measure uh, position, velocity, as well as, as acceleration. And actually, we are working on some, some, some elevator because um, this would be the, the, the elevator steel wire, which is now replaced by, by this kind of elevator steel. The optical encoders are based on, on, on I mean, on, on some pulses, okay? So then we replace this part with the microwave system, which is also planar, and the tag could be printed here, and we take advantage of the planar devices, the screen printing to print here the, the resonators, as well as, well, uh more complex uh in order to more complex in the system we can add some absolute position and finally to conclude well it's actually a summary i talk about the conventional rfid the chipped uh systems which are well established and the number the number of application are still growing uh even so there are some some research focus right now on, on new capabilities, such as uh, sensing, RFID uh, able to sensing. The same with chipless RFID. There are also some research focus on, on sensing this kind of, of chipless RFID. And I told you the different approaches, time domain, frequency domain, as well as hybrid. And I finally have been talk uh, so long. Um, about the, the approach that, that has been proposed in our group in Cimitec, which is a near field chipless RFID with sequential bit reading, which can be applied, for example, to secure papers or other mm, papers, uh, medical receipts or even ballots in order to, to determine the elections or so on. And these systems, the synchronous ones, can be also applied to the motion control, for example, to determine the position, the velocity, uh, as well as the, the acceleration. And thank you very much for giving the, the opportunity to, to talk. And it has been a pleasure. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Paredes, for your conference, a great conference. Now we'll pass to some question. Uh, Dr. Eloy, you have any question? Yes, thank you, Dr. Fontes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Paredes, for this clear presentation. <laughs> I have just a couple of questions. Um, uh, can you show, please, slide 40, please? You said 40, right? 40, yes. Or zero. Ah, no problem. 
my computer is not as fast as I want. Uh, we have some time. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It's okay. For 40. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's pretty nice. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Um, first question, um, which is the word length of the information here in this uh, synchronous chipless RFID? You, you said, sorry, the work? How many bits are there in every uh, yeah. word? Yeah, um, here right now we have some periodicity of, of 40 millimeters. So depending on the size of, of your tag, you can include as bits as, as you want. For example, as imagine yeah, as you want. For example, imagine you have some, some for example, paper. Yeah, so you can divide in, 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 in sets of four, four millimeters. And I don't know, it's like, I don't know how much uh, bits you can do some dinner code in some this conventional paper, but you can include all, I mean, the, the period, the DP, DPS and DPL are two kind of, of variables that you can use for measure these, 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 these magnitudes. And I think I have in another table, but it's the periodicity, it's four millimeters. Four millimeters. Okay. Just a last question. Which is the distance to read this uh, RFID? Yeah, very, it's, the, yeah it's, a very good, it's a very good question. Depending on the system. But in this system, I can read distance for, um, I, I will guess, from um, 0 0.5 millimeters up to 2 millimeters. Oh. This is a small distance. I know yes. that. But, but this is as I mentioned, for some kind of specific um, applications, for example, secure paper, or in this case, elevators. In elevators, we locate some, some this is the, the, I mean, here. This would be the, 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 um, the how I say, this part would be then chart to, hang up and down the, the elevator okay elevator. and if we locate the reader very close to here yeah so it works with the um, with the elevator and we can get uh, the the position of the elevator in in any in any in any movement okay. but uh, as you said it has to be very close to very the, close uh, yeah okay thank, thank you. you very much for your questions Thank you, Dr. Fontes. Yes, uh, we have one question from the chat. You say, can you comment a little, a little bit more on the organic device you mentioned, please? Is it all organic structure and how well or bad they behave in comparison to their not organic counterpart? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, basically, okay, here. Um, uh, come on. Sorry, there is some delay. Okay, here. Okay, so the uh, as I mentioned, we want this proposed chipless work uh, implemented on paper and and ink. The first the first step was implement the these resonators using paper and ink with. Uh, nanoparticles of silver. The conductivity is quite similar to to to, to silver. Actually, it's one order lower than the than the than the silver. But even but even so, we are still reading these structures. Organic orga organic are more complicated because the conductivity is very 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 low. Okay, so. If you compare, for example, the magnitude, here the magnitude is lower than in other cases, and it's difficult to fix some thresholds here for all the values. Okay. So, I mean, if we have to differentiate the, the zeros and ones, we have to uh, draw some lines here. 
and with organic ink is difficult because its conductivity is low um, so then we can locate these structures very close um, i don't i don't remember exactly what kind of i mean i know this is the organic ink that we use but i don't remember exactly the um, the features of this of these these this ink but as i know uh it was some some uh how is it uh, carbon so, ca carbon i mean the the main goal was that we want some ink able to be uh recyclable i mean green and we tried to do with this which is close uh close to the the goal that we want but it was employed i guess uh two or three years ago so maybe right now there are other inks. I don't know if I answer exactly your question. Thank you very much for the answer. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Eloy, have you any other question? No, thank you. It's OK. Thank you, Dr. Fontes. Thank you very much. OK. The, with this, finished the, this talk. The Polytechnical Institute, through the Eugenio Mendez de Curro, Chair, gives mm -hmm. the present recognition to Ferran, Ferran Paredes for your participation in the web, webinar High Frequency and Terahertz Device and Circuits Perspectives on Emerging and Advanced Technologies, Part 2, with the conference Chipets and Chipless RFID, State of the Art and Application. Thank you very much, Dr. Ferran Paredes. Thank you very much for invitation and, and for this seminar, which is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our last conference is with the Dr. Anidia Mukherjee. Anidia Mukherjee received the Bachelor Tech and Master Tech degrees in Electronics and Communication Engineering from the University of Calcutta, Kolkata, India. He received doctor engineering degree in the year of 2017 from the Share for Electron Device and Integrate Circuits, Technische Universität Dresden, Germany. He is currently working in the same chair on the field of high frequency analog circuit design using silicon germanium bipolar CMOS and in, in P process. He also worked on designing analog circuit using CNT feed process. His main research interests include millimeter watt power amplifier design using HBTs and on wafer measuring of analog millimeter watt circuits. Doctor, you have the microphone for the next 13 minutes. And after that, we'll have some question, if it's OK with you. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, OK. Very good. So let me just uh, share my screen. Can you see my screen now? Hello? Yes, perfect. Yes, it's okay. Okay, perfect. okay, yeah. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Fontes for his kind presentation um, introduction. And I would like to say hello to everybody who, who are attending this uh, conference, uh, the online conference. And um, the topic of my presentation today is RF circuit design with advanced transistor technologies. And I am working in, as Dr. Fontes uh, told, that I'm uh, working in the Technical University Dresden in Germany. In, uh, the chair um, mainly organized by Professor Michael Schorter. It is a chair mainly for the different compact modeling of HBTs, CNT fates, CMOS as well. And there is another small group, in the same chair, who are, who, which is working on the analog high frequency circuit design. 
and I am part of that design group. And today, my presentation, I have broken up my presentation into following parts. First, the introduction, where I would like to talk about my preferred technology choice of my uh, device for designing analog high frequency circuits. It's mainly by CMOS process. And there, uh, after that, I would like to discuss uh, the uh, three circuits like low noise amplifier, power amplifiers, and uh, mixers, which are basically main critical parts in any transceiver chain. And ultimately, then after that, I would like to conclude my talk in the conclusion sections. So let's start with the introduction that we all know that um, nowadays a lot of systems are being designed, tested in the millimeter of or submillimeter wave microwave range. And one of the main reason for uh, behind it is the recent progress in the BICMOS process. As the name suggests, in this process, we can fabricate CMOS and the bipolar transistor on the same wafer. So as we know that nowadays, a lot of complex systems are currently being available in a single chip that is called the system on chip. And you can see in the same slide that this is a very typical block diagram of a system of chip, which contains microprocessor, memory, logic, and as well as a transceiver part. And if you see that apart from this transceiver part, most of the parts are basically digital and can be implemented using CMOS. However, this transceiver part, that means the analog part, which is communicating between the chip with the outside world, it's mainly the analog part. Now, if we consider from the device, uh, from the design point of view, then we can find that usually designing of the digital circuits or the systems can be represented mainly in the algorithmic format. And uh, that can be automated as well, because in case of the digital design, they are basically following some logic rules. So that will be easier to represent, to, to, to automate the entire design process. However, in case of analog circuit, the story is a little bit different because depending on the circuit topologies, diversity of the device structures, also depending on the size of the devices, analog circuit design could be different for different person for different groups. And due to that, this analog circuit design, this whole working process of analog circuit design has become a kind of complex endeavor. Now, depending on the nonlinearities and the parasitics, the analog circuit design is also um, uh, very sensitive to this kind of uh, to these issues, because if I, if I operate a transistor in a particular operating region, for example, the power amplifier, if I operate the transistor in the nonlinear region, then compared, then its performance will be totally different from a small signal amplifier, which is operating in the linear region. And at the same time, the analog high frequency circuit is strongly influenced by different physical effects at the device level, and which is not so important for the digital circuits. And that's the reason till now the analog designs are still largely being handcrafted. And when you are handcraft this kind of analog circuit design, so the analog circuit design activities are basically a kind of bottleneck in terms of design time, effort and cost. So if you design a particular analog circuit, you fabricate it, and if it doesn't work, then it will be really difficult to find out the reason because you are designing some circuits actually, means very small integrated circuits. And at the same time, in case of analog circuit design, if you need to have a suppose 10 dBm of output power from your chip, so at least you should get that value means when you measure the circuit, at least you should get a very close value to that. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense to use that particular circuit in any system. And 
for that, the analog circuit design, we need very good accurate physics-based compact models so that we can reduce the design errors and we can realize our circuit at the first, first try, actually. Now, if we consider the device compact model, then usually the high frequency verification of the compact model is typically done experimentally on the de-embedded data. And usually our circuit designers are provided the transistors figures of merit like FT, F max, Y parameters. But we are not sure because we have to work with this kind of parameters and depending on the situation, depending on the demand by the uh, system designers for which basically the circuit designers are working, they, this kind of figures of merit of a transistor may not, be, um, may not be sufficient. And we would like to discuss about this in the next slide. Now, the point is that what kind of device we would like to use for our analog circuit design? There are RF CMOS, HBTs, that means heterojunction bipolar transistor. Now, the general perception in the market is that RF CMOS is enough because most of the fabs are uh, design means they are fabricating the RF CMOS and they are also enough for the high frequency uh, circuit design. However, if we do the fact check, then we can find that usually the complementary MOS, which is being used for the high frequency applications are basically the N MOS. Now, it is also possible that from N MOS, we can get very good or competitive RF performance, but it is happening only with the advanced no node. Advanced node means lower, the, the, num, the, the, the gate length is really small actually, and we can see in the next slide. Till now, the balanced silicon based NMOS a high frequency device, they has, have around cut off frequency around 600 gigahertz. And till now, the most of the high frequency circuit applications using MOSFET are limited to 100 gigahertz actually. Now, if we see this slide, this slide compares the cutoff frequencies of heterojunction bipolar transistor and silicon-based MOSFET versus the critical dimension. Critical dimension in case of a MOSFET is basically the gate length. And in case of a HBT, it will be the emitter width, which is BE0 here. It is represented by that. And if you see the first plot, suppose the FT plot, you can see in order to get more than 100 gigahertz of FT, I have to reduce the gate length considerably around 55 nanometer or something like that. However, in case of HBT, silicon germanium HBT, which is represented by the green um, symbol, we can have enough FT or competitive FT at the higher node. That means around 130 nanometer node, we can get FT around 400 or 350 gigahertz. In case of Indian for indium phosphide devices, we can definitely, they have very high FT and F max, and that can be achieved at the higher node. That means maybe in um, uh, 250 nanometer node as well, we can achieve this kind of performance. And the similar story for the F max, you can see for having very high F max, we have to go at very, advanced node for the CMOS. However, we don't need to go for HBTs, we don't need to go to the advanced node. Now, why I'm trying to say always the advanced node, because if we go to the advanced node, that means from 130 nanometer node, if we go to the 90 nanometer node or 55 nanometer node, the cost will be very, very high. However, in case of the HBT, we can achieve the similar performance as compared to the CMOS at the advanced node. And it's a high integration with the silicon germanium by, by CMOS process. So it enables us to use the HBTs available in a by CMOS process for RF circuit design. Now, why it is happening that why we are talking about this advanced node, because if we see this, the very simple block diagram of a MOSFET and a HBT, you can see that this is the gate length and this is the emitter width. However, the main difference between the CMOS or the MOSFET and our HBT is the 
MOSFET is a lateral structure. So current will be flowing like this one here in case of MOSFET. In case of uh, HBT, it's a vertical structure. The current will be flowing like this, which means in order to increase FT for a CMOS, I have to reduce the gate length. That means I have to use a very good lithographic tool. In case of HBT, this is not the story because of its vertical structure. I can control the vertical dimensions using the atomic layer, dim atomic layer dimensions, which can be controlled with much higher accuracy. Yes, it is also true that we can go to the very good lithographic with a very advanced note. However, it will increase the cost again. So that means in case of HBT, we don't need to go to the advanced note. That means we can reduce the cost of fabrication. Huh? Then this slide, there is a very critical question that we have been talking about the figures of merit, that is the FT and Fmax of any device. But does it mean the FT and Fmax of a device, when we use this device in a circuit, does the device re, re, retain the sim, similar FT and Fmax? The answer is no. Because the device speed doesn't mean it's the circuit speed. It is different compared to the circuit speed. Because the FT is basically defined by the ratio of the transconductance divided by the input capacitance. Now, FT doesn't tell us about the absolute value of the GM and the C in. So that means low GM and low C in can lead to the same FT as high GM and high C in because it's a ratio. Now, if we see this particular figure, in case of any process, the active device is in the lowest level, then there will be so many metal layers. So you are for introduction, I just put six metal layers. So these metal layers are connecting the devices. And here in this figure, actually, I showed uh, the the three three dimensional structure of a device and you can see the device is residing here and this is the base connection and this is the collector connection and due to this kind of metal structure at high frequency they introduce a lot of parasitics that means capacitances as well as inductance and it will definitely impact the ft and you can see from this plot the solid line is for the HBT and the dotted line is for the NMOS. And you can see that this is the de-embedded FT. And when we consider all this metal stack, you can see that there is a decrease of FT by 20% in case of HBT, whereas in case of MOSFET, it is around 50%. And why this is happening? Because HBT already has GM, which is quite high as compared to the GM of any FET devices. So HBTs are, are advantageous for the high frequency circuit design as well. However, here I would like to mention that I'm not here to prove the superiority of HBT. What I'm trying to say is that silicon germanium HBT has got enough potential to be used for millimeter wave circuits and the system. And that can be achieved without being without using the advanced CMOS node. That means we can save some money. It will be less, co the, 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 the cost will be less if we design something with the HBTs in the same by CMOS process. Now, I would like to start with designing some high frequency circuits. And before that, I would like to show a very basic block diagram of a transceiver. So you can see there are a switch and the antenna is connected to the switch. And then there are some filters, LNAs, mixers, and power amplifiers. So first we would like to talk about, about these three circuits. And first I would, I would like to talk about the LNA. And here I would like to do the low power design using HBTs. And low power design usually the Basic conception is valid only for the digital applications, but it is also possible to do the low power design using HBTs. And how we can do the low power design? It is possible to reduce the collector emitter voltage of a HBT. 
However, reducing the collector emitter voltage, we need to find first that whether it is affecting the FT or F max of the device. Now, if you see the plot here, you can see that even with VBC, that is, that means base collector junction, usually base collector junction should be reverse bias, but here I have made the base collector junction forward bias by 0 0.5 volt. Still, we are getting around 250 gigahertz of FT at this bias voltage, actually. And in this plot, this is a plot by uh, IHP SG13G2 technology. SG13G2 is a 130 nanometer bicimos process. And this process provides both HICOM and VIVIC, both kind of model. And you can see the HICOM, the high current model, it works well, it matches well with the measured data of the FT. So using this concept, that means that I can reduce the VCE in order to operate the transistor in the saturation region. I can still design the circuit and that will definitely reduce the DC power consumption of the circuit. Now, this is a wideband low noise amplifier. We have used only a single stage in order to keep it very simple. And this is a cascade configuration because cascade configuration gives better small signal gain and better reverse isolation. And you can see that the total biasing supply voltage is only 1.4, only 1.4 volt. That means each transistor is getting around 0 0.7 volt. However, the volt 0 0.7 will be less because there, will, there are so many transmission lines. And so it will be at finally, it will be coming around 0 0.65 or something like that. And the emitter size of the transistor, you can see it is giving here. And all the inductors, these are means inductors, which is required for designing a, a, a RF circuits. They are being implemented using some transmission lines. You can, you can see these kind of transmission lines here and all the transmission lines and the capacitances, they are EM simulated. Now, in order to do the noise matching, here we have used a pi matching network. And what is that? It is basically that if we consider the small signal representation of the input, there is a C pi input capacitance of the, tran of the transistor. We put a similar capacitance here, which is C in, and then there is a, uh, inductance, base inductance here. And if we solve the equation of the input impedance, we can find by this expression, Z in equals to this expression. And if we solve this expression for 50 ohm, because our input is 50 ohm, then we can find two frequencies uh, for the solution. One is omega one equals to zero. That means it's a DC. And another is omega two given by this expression. From this expression, we can determine the value of LB. So basically, if we plot the corresponding S11, we can find there will be two deep. One is at zero. That means at omega one equals to zero. And another determined by the omega two, which is further determined by the value of the C pi LB and Z0 is basically 50 ohm. Now, if we see this, um, slides, then we can find that the second matching, the second matching is basically determined by the values of the base inductor LB and the C pi. Now, our objective is to design the circuit between in, in, the, in, in the W band. And initially, we set our frequency between 90 gigahertz to 110 gigahertz. And 100 gigahertz is the center frequency. So we consider that we would like to have a second deep at the 100 gigahertz. And another point is that, that adding only LB and the C in, in the circuit is not enough because you need a blocking DC capacitor, which will separate your RF signal from the DC. Now this blocking DC capacitor will definitely impact the performance of the circuit. So you can see there are two plots. So without LB and C in, the green plot shows that the, the, the trend of the S11. 
Now, once we put LV and C in in the circuit, now you can see there are there are two drops. One is at the zero by it is being shown by the red curves. One is at the zero, another is at 100 gigahertz. However, if we put a DC blocking capacitor, this DC blocking capacitor will also influence this one. And you see this second, the first deep now is being shifted to the higher frequency. So in case we use the two picofarad capacitor, the deep is shifted. Now we use 100 femtofarad capacitor. You can see the deep, deep is really shifted. However, the actual deep around 100 gigahertz is quite okay. Quite okay. It is around 10 gigahertz. Uh, it is around minus 10 dB. So now this is the fabrication. When the chip was fabricated, it was fabricated using SG13 G2 technology. The SG13 G2 technology has got uh, seven metal layers and all the inductors and the transmission lines are, um, are implemented using the highest metal layers. That is the top metal two. And the circuit has been measured using you know, the key site uh, PNA 8361C with 67 to 110 gigahertz frequency extenders. And you can see the, 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 the comparison between the measured results and the simulation is quite okay. The maximum small signal gain I'm getting around 12 dB and the 3 dB bandwidth is around 50 gigahertz. So around from um, uh, 67 to 117, something like that. But our equipment limits our frequency measurement uh, until 110 gigahertz. But if we follow the trend, it is beyond that. And the gain variation within the bandwidth of interest is around 2 dB. The noise figure, we have measured the noise figure not in tube resident, but uh, we don't have that high frequency noise measurement system. So we have to go to uh, University of Bordeaux and you can see the noise measurement also is quite okay. And it is lowest noise figure is around four dB at 85 gigahertz and maximum around five, five dB around 90 gigahertz. The saturated output power is around two dBm, but obviously it is quite, it is low because the, we have paid the price for the low supply voltage. If you increase the supply voltage, definitely we can get better 1 dB completion point and better uh, saturated power. So with this, I would like to show the, the comparison uh, table. And you can see this, if we, you can, you can go to this paper, the silicon RF paper, where this work has been published. And you can find the comparison table there as well. And we can say that this, even we can operate the silicon germanium HBDs in the saturation region, still it gives competitive performance at the lower power con consumption. With this, I would like to start the another circuit that is the mixer, which is very important for any transceiver system. So it basically shifts the frequency of an input signal and it produces output consists of sum and differences of the frequency. And we need a bandpass filter to follow, to filter out the proper frequencies. And when we apply LO and the RF and we get some kind of uh, intermediate frequency, usually you call it down conversion. Otherwise, if we get IF and the LO and we are getting some RF, it is called the up frequency con conversion. And here we would like to design a direct down conversion frequency con uh, mixer. And Usually it is being used in a homodyne receiver. That means we are directly down convert a W band signal to around 500 megahertz, which can be used by the digital uh, signal processor for further processing. Now that there are some advantages. One of them is it reduces the power consumption. It reduces the dependency on on-chip filters. It provides very good high level of integration. However, the disadvantages are problems with the DC offsets, even order distortion, and the higher frequent noise. This mixer has been implemented using Infineon's 130 nanometer silicon germanium HBT technologies. Compared to IHP HBT technologies, it has got uh, six metal layers. IHP got, got uh, seven metal layers. It has got six metal layers, and metal five and metal six are the thickest one. And if you again see the FT and Fmax plot, that even with VBC 
zero point five volt, that is positive VBC, we are still getting around one eighty gigahertz and two hundred one eighty gigahertz FT and two hundred gigahertz F max at this frequency uh, at this bias point. So with this one, we can target our low frequent low power design scheme, and this is the the schematic of the down conversion W band down direct down conversion mixer. The mixer is based on the standard Gilbert cell. And here, in order to save the power, we have used a transformer because if we connect transistor Q5 and Q6 directly with this Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4, then Q5 and Q6 will be in the cascode mode. And then I have to increase the VCC too much. Then if we increase the VCC, then it will increase the power dissipation as well. So we have used a transformer here. And you can see the layout of the transformer. The transform transformer was implemented using the metal six and the metal five. And this is the micro chip uh, from the, the, the dive photograph of the chip. The, this is the IF output, which is, and this is the LO input, RF input, and these are the DC bias. The chip size is around 1.15 by 1.54 millimeter square. And in this mixer, we have used an additional amplifier in order to amplify the output power, um, output um, uh, 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 conversion gain, because otherwise um, this buffer amplifier was not sufficient uh, to have enough gain, uh, enough uh, conversion gain at the output. Now this slide shows the measurement of the W band direct down conversion mixer. Compared to the LNA measurement, it is completely different because it is a, a large signal uh, um, circuit. So the ALO was provided using a active multiplier chain. Uh, an active multiplier chain is getting uh, some signal from the key site 83650B generator. The RF was provided by the PNA. And then we provide the DC power supply and we measure the output using the spectrum analyzer. And you can see that there is some differences between the measurement and the simulation. However, we can get around 5 dB conversion gain over the um, uh, frequency range of 9 gigahertz. The differences is mainly coming from the, uh, uh, the compact model provided by the, uh, uh, by the foundry. And uh, one of our colleagues is now working on that to find out the better parameters, better uh, model parameters for this IFX process. Excuse me, doctor, you have five minutes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and then this slide shows the, the comparison of the W band direct down conversion mixers with the recently published uh, uh, mixers. And uh, you can find the paper as well. And um, we can see that this, uh, now, uh, in this case, in our case, it is around only 22 milliwatt of um, uh, DC uh, power we required. But in for the other cases, actually, it is quite high. In case of uh, um, reference nine, they are using only 9.6 milliwatt. However, this is only the mixer core. And in my case, we have provided the mixer core plus two amplifiers. So that's why the PDC is a little bit higher compared to this, uh, uh, this results. Now, I would like to go for another very important component of any receiver transceiver chain, that is the power amplifier. And this is a conduction angle power amplifier. That means here transistor operates as a voltage controlled current source. And depending on where you operate your transistors, you can define class A, class B, class AB, class CPS. And it is true that uh, if we operate a transistor in common emitter mode, it gives better power added efficiency. However, it provides less gain. Cascode provides definitely higher gain, but it provides less power added efficiency because you need to provide higher power in order to bias both the transistors. This power amplifier we have used, um, we have designed in, again, Infineons 130 nanometer silicon germanium process which gives FT and Fmax around 250 and 370 gigahertz respectively. And the collector emitter breakdown voltage with base open is around 1.5 volt. Here, I would like to mention that 
because it's a power amplifier, it's not a low power circuit. So we don't care about the power, uh, the, the power consumption. Basically, we care about the output power. And we would like to do this design at the G band around 180 gigahertz. So here, the devices provided by the PDK is not optimized for power amplified design. So you need to optimize the device. That means you need to do the layout in a such a way that the device along with the layout, that means the metal stack gives you better power added efficiency and the output power. And here our power cell, we call it a power cell. We, uh, power cell consists of basically four transistors. It's a differential power amplifier. So Q3 and Q1 and Q4 and Q2, they are in cascode formation. And this is the layout of this uh, um, uh, the power cell. So you can see these are the Q1, Q2, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. And uh, this is the bypass uh, capacitor at the base of the uh, Q3 and Q4. And this is the bypass capacitor. You can see the 3D view. This bypass capacitor is grounded from the both the, from both the sides. Now the load pool has been performed for to this P power cell in order to determine the optimum Z opt. And when we find the optimum Z opt, then we design the output matching network to transfer the maximum power to the 50 ohm load. Unfortunately, this has been uh, uh, fabricated. However, the you know the G band circuit measurement setup is quite difficult, and we are currently doing this G band circuit measurement setup. So it has not been measured yet. But you can see the layout of this uh, circuit, the uh, this 180 gigahertz power amplifier. The chip size is around 1.2 by 0 0.65 millimeter square, and it is a differential one, so we need a balloon at the input and output in order to convert the dual-ended output to the single-ended one. And this slide shows the simulation results of this power amplifier. The small signal gain of the power amplifier is around 14.5 dB at 180 gigahertz. And this PA gives around 5.2 dBm saturated power at 180 gigahertz and power added efficiency around 1%. Yeah, it is obviously somebody, some, some, some can say, raise some um, question that why it is low, but the, at the, um, at the G band or very high frequency, the gain is so low usually. So you need to use so many stages that will increase the DC power consumption. And this will bring down the power added efficiency of the whole amplifier chain. So now I would like to conclude my talk. So as we say that the physics-based geometric scalable model are very, very important for doing analog circuit design because for doing the circuit optimization, when you are doing the circuit optimization, you have to be very careful and you have to be, you have to use very good model so that you can, when you simulate something, you can get the proper output. The transistors, when it operates in the saturation still can yield more than 200 gigahertz cutoff frequency, and that helps us to design millimeter wave circuit at the reduced supply voltage. Regarding the LNA, there is a very good agreement between the circuit measurement and the simulation. In case of mixer, investigation is on to find out the differences between the measurement and simulation. In case of PA, I would like to means measure the PA once the G-band setup is complete. And finally, I would like to say that the silicon germanium biosimos technology, although with the relaxed lithography, it offers great potential for implementing low power millimeter of circuits and system. And I would like to thank you all for your um, attendance. And I'd like to thank uh, everybody who is uh, who are attending this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Anidia Mukherjee, for your conference, for your great conference. Um, we have one question from the chat. Sure. You say, in the slide 19. 19, okay, yeah. What is the reason behind the DC offset? Can this be compensated by a circuit solution or uh, I just need a compensation. Usually, you, yes. 
Yeah, usually you need a circuit compensation for usually for this DC offset. You need a kind of circuit compensation. Yes, you are right. Because it's mainly used for the homodyne receiver. In case of heterodyne receiver, you don't down convert the frequency in a single step. So you don't need that there as well. Okay, thank you, doctor. The second question, you have worked also with CNT fit by basic circuit design. Yeah. We know emerging technology are not a competitor right now for the silicon German bipolar CMOS in this moment. But, but what is your opinion in emerging transistor? I would say because um, till now the CNT fits, what we have measured in our lab, the FT is around 8 gigahertz or 10 gigahertz, something like that, I remember. And some of them, FT is quite low. However, CNT has very uh, good quality. This is the linearity. The linearity is quite good. So if we consider the CNT fit in the frequency range of, suppose, our mobile telecommunication, that means around 800 to 900 gigahertz or maximum on one, uh, one, uh, one gigahertz, 800 to 900 megahertz, or until one gigahertz actually. It is a competitive candidate for doing analog circuit design at this frequency range. But at the same time, I would like to say that there is some problem with the noise in the CNT fit. And these noise issues must be solved so that later the circuit designers, they can make better low noise amplifier with this CNT fit because when you, bring one particular technology, there will be always a competitor in the market. So if I say CNT fit is very good and the linear, in case of the linearity and everything, somebody can definitely say, okay, then CMOS is already there and CMOS noise figure is quite low compared to CNT fit. So uh, I think the device designers and the process designers, I think, um, uh, also should try to solve this uh, this problem. This is a noise inherent noise problem in the CNT fit as well. However, means apart from that, I would say the CNT fit is a quite good candidate um, for analog circuit design in future. Thank you very much for the answer, Doctor. And uh, Doctor, <coughs> pardon, Doctor Eloy, have you any any question? Yes, thank you, Doctor Fontes. Dr. Anindya, thank you so much to be here thank you. for your clear and pretty well presentation. It's a pleasure to see you again. Um, thank you. Can you go to the slide 22, please? Slide 22, yeah. Yes, here um, we have different uh, technologies, a comparison. Uh, which are the main um, figures of merit to compare not only mixers, but also switches uh, between different technologies, Wh which are the main uh, figures of merit? Uh, you are talking about from the circuit point of view or from the device point of view? Circuit or the point circuit view. point of view. Yes. Okay. So mainly, I think it is for any mixer, it's the conversion gain. And then the uh, DC power consumption. And on, of, of, after that, actually, there could be some, what will be the, your saturated power from the mixer? Because when you get the mixer, after that, there will be some amplifier, actually. So the saturated power is also very important. So mainly the conversion gain, DC uh, power consumption, saturated power, saturated output power of the mixer, they're mainly the, you can consider them as a main figures of merit of a mixer. On top of that, um, in many cases, noise figure of a mixer is a very important thing. But here I couldn't show it because in our lab, it was not possible to measure the noise figure of a mixer at W band. In fact, measuring noise figure of a mixer at W band or even for a device is, is quite challenging actually. So, but noise figure is also another very important factor for a mixer design, yeah. Okay, and for switches, for switches, I would say that, um, uh, you know, the transmission actually, that means the S21 is the most important thing and the uh, uh, insertion loss in case of a switch. 
obviously the power consumption will be one of the main issue and yeah mainly the transmission uh, the the insertion loss and the power con consum consumption actually is the main issue actually in case of switches as well excellent well in your opinion in the next years which technology will the main very very high frequency uh, circuits and, and systems silicon germanium indium phosphide in and emergent technology <laughs> yeah this is a very good question i would say because it depends on means how you develop your system actually and it depends on how the companies and other uh, who are designing their their systems so first of all let's start with the bicmos process that means you are generating cmos or you are fabricating cmos and hbts in a same wafer so mm -hmm. it is possible we know that and using this bicmos process you can go at very high frequency using hbts and then using cmos you can do the digital signal processing on the same wafer now ihp that is one research institute in germany they have already done and they have been doing these things that they have been growing the indium phosphide devices on silicon germanium wafer as well mm -hmm. so if you go to the ihp website you can find they do some kind of wafer run where they integrate the indium phosphide along with the bicmos process so there has been some kind of uh trial to do that because indium phosphide hbt is there they really give quite um, good performance actually now there are gallium arsenide technologies as well however in case of gallium arsenide um, uh, this technology is quite okay but you know the arsenic is a kind of carcinogenic component so when we are using this in our mobile telephone and when we throw out our mobile telephone it is not good for the nature as well mm -hmm. and price is also quite high means silicon is available plenty in a, in our nature actually so bicmos process i would say is a uh, i would say one of the uh, future player for the uh, next generation circuit development and systems because a lot of people now now they are going to 22 nanometer 28 nanometer technology in cmos and everything is done by the silicon germanium and if we implement the hbt on top of that you know to take care of the you know transceiver part of any system so that will make the uh, the work quite good i would say okay thank you for your explanation dr an india thank you dr fontes it's okay we you. have two more questions from the chat yeah, i think sure. we have some time yeah, sure. uh, the first the first one is how important is a compact model for circuit designer do you prefer table based model or physics based model the second one okay so let's let us take out the first uh, question that is the compact model well compact model is really important for your circuit design because in case of analog circuit design which is very very important that is the scaling scaling means when you change the device dimension how does the transconductance or the current is being changed and that can only be answered by a compact model scalable compact model so in case of a power amplifier let me give an example in case of a power amplifier design the device i have chosen from infineon technology the infineon technology gives the maximum device length around 10 micrometer that means the emitter length is 10 micrometer emitter width is 130 nanometer usually now obviously from the first look we can definitely say okay in order to get more power i will definitely prefer the highest length device that means 10 micrometer length device in practice is it true i would say no because when you choose the highest length device and when you put all the metal stack when you connect those devices using the metal stack they will give lot of parasitics when they give this lot of parasitics that means you will lose your output power you will lose your power array efficiency so usually the highest output power or highest power array efficiency doesn't happen at very high frequency that means in g band doesn't happen at the highest 
length devices, but somewhere in between, maybe not at 10 micrometer, maybe around seven micrometer or six micrometer, somewhere there. So that means when you are doing this kind of scaling, how you can predict what will be your current, what will be your input capacitance, what will be your input uh, 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 base resistance, that can only be answered by the compact model. Now, the second question, if I remember correctly, whether the table-based model, yes, table-based model is also okay for a quick design. That is, I completely agree with that. But then for each devices, you need a separate table for each kind of each dimension for each dimension. So for two, two micrometer dimension, I need a separate table for three micrometer dimension. I need a separate table for seven micrometer dimension. I need a separate table. And when I was doing, I'm doing the entire design, maybe in, in, in some part, I'm using a 10 micrometer device in some parts, three micrometer device in some parts, five micrometer device for each devices. I have to use a separate table actually. However, if I use a compact model, it doesn't care with what kind of devices you are, what kind of dimensions you are using, because it is using some kind of scalable equation, scaling equation, it will automatically connect this, uh, the, uh, the device performance with a particular dimension. So yes, table-based uh, model is also okay, but at this high frequency, table-based model is not accurate, actually. There will be some differences as well between the simulation and the measurement. I don't know whether um, uh, it answers my question, but if you, there is any other questions, please let me know. Thank you very much for the answer. Dr. Eloy, have you any other question? No, it's okay for me. Thank you, Dr. Fontes. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for inviting me in this session. And it was a really great pleasure to you know, uh, give such kind of presentation and also exchanging the ideas and answering the questions and everything. It was really nice. I would say I would like to thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ani India. Thank you very much, doctor. Um, the National Polytechnic Institute through the Eugenio Mendez, the current chair, give the present recognition to Anidia Mukherjee for your participation in the webinar high frequency and terahertz device and circuits perspectives on emerging and advanced technology part two with the conference rf circuit design with advanced tr transistor technologies thank you very much doctor you're welcome thank you very much for inviting me it was really a great pleasure to be part of this webinar thank you all thank you very much thank you Thank you to all. And finally, it's time to close the event. Uh, on behalf of the Instituto Politécnico Nacional of Mexico, uh, I thank to the speakers and to the audience to be here. Uh, we hope you will be in the next uh, session of the next year here with new um, uh, talks Pretty, pretty interesting. So thank you to all and goodbye. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye.